One time, uh, one of the leaders of the Anglican Church, in which, of course, John Wesley had initially been a native minister, he was, he was upset with Wesley, and he questioned Wesley. He said, I hear that in your meetings and your services that some of the congregation, they cry out in hysteria. And he said, is this true? Is this actually happening at your meetings? Because, of course, the Anglican Church was a very dull, formalistic church. And Wesley said, it is true. He said, when the sinners, when they hear how close they are to spend an eternity in the pits of hell, where there's weeping and gnashing and teeth, they cry out to God that somehow he might have mercy on their reprobate souls. Because there's no man living who is even remotely worthy of the salvation of that beautiful love that God offers us to the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Wesley said it is true that these people, they cry out, and we pray with them, and we bring them to that peace which no man can take away, and no, which the world cannot give and cannot take. And of course, the Anglican bishop, not being converted himself, was astounded upset that something like this could be happening. Well, let us begin a prayer. I never had much prayer today, but I just never feel comfortable with starting to speak unless that we pray. So let's ask the Lord's blessing. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ in heaven today, we just pray that you would be with us this morning, Lord, that you would guide everything that we say, Lord. And Lord Jesus, even as you spurred the pastor's heart to anoint and pray for the sick here this morning, that you would spur me, Lord, to, to bring up the scriptures and the, and the histories and the stories, Lord, which will help this congregation the most in their needs. And Lord, that you would be with us this morning, that we would walk in the Spirit and preach in the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, what is the, what book is the foundation of all of life? The Bible. Well, let's turn to the scriptures. We always start with the scriptures. Um, so we'll start with the scriptures, and I'm going to use some scriptures that refer to a nation. Yes, we we're talking about John Wesley this morning. You know, John Wesley himself was the same bishop that complained about people crying out for salvation. So that same bishop, Wesley, well, the bishop tried to tell Wesley that he could no longer preach, I believe, in that particular area. And Wesley said that when the hands of, I think it was the Archbishop of Canterbury, were laid on him to anoint him to be a minister of the gospel, that he believed that because of the Great Commission, that not just London or Bristol, England, but the whole world was his parish. And we, each of believers here, the whole world is our parish. Now we may be only in a small part of the world, and we may not, we may never travel thousands of miles like John Wesley did. But we need to see it in the light of what it is. So for our first scripture here, let's turn to a very familiar one. Psalm 33, verse 12. And you might say, well, why do I pick verses about a nation when I'm speaking about John Wesley? You know, if you study the histories of two countries, namely England and France, in the 18th century, John Wesley preached, I think it was for 64 years, in the nation of England. And the result was that that nation became a Christian nation. That does not mean that every person in England was converted. Maybe only 40% of the people were generally converted, but the entire nation was affected. Yet in France, where there was no preaching, and I think the French even tried to, you know, we heard of Notre Dame burning recently, and, and I think in those days the French even tried to uh, make Notre Dame a church of atheism. But what happened in France? The French Revolution, people were beheaded, guillotined. I just saw recently when Napoleon himself, before he was emperor, you know, there were maybe, I think, 20,000 of the king's loyalists and and Napoleon had the cannon loaded, I believe, with grape shot. And he just, he said, he later bragged, I cleared the street with grape shot. I think he killed about 20,000 people. That did not happen in England. Where the preaching of the word of God was, it did not happen. But where there was no preaching, it might as well have been as bad as pagan Africa or cannibal, cannibalism. But Psalm 33, 
Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Now let's turn to Proverbs 14.34. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And one more scripture, Psalms 9, verse 17. Psalm 9, 17. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Now let me turn to a quote here. I always love to, I don't always start with this quote, but I think it's a great quote. You know, we live in the United States, and what we're going to be speaking about today, the life of John Wesley, serving the Lord Jesus Christ as he did, but how it relates to what, what we have today. And, um, you know, I think there in Malachi it says, I am the Lord God, I change not. And I think that's a scripture that should just soak into your hearts, that I am the Lord God, I change not. And so it was possible in 1740, 1760, in those days, the wondrous 18th century, full of revival. Those things can happen today. But here is a quote from one of our founding fathers, John Dickinson. Rendering thanks to my creator for my existence and station among his works. For my birth in a country enlightened by the gospel. And enjoying freedom. And for all his other kindnesses, to him I resign myself, humbly confiding in his goodness and in his mercy through Jesus Christ for the events of eternity. And the, one of the questions I would ask this morning, what did John Dickinson, sign of the Constitution and God to believe about the civil government of Pennsylvania and Delaware, what did he mean when he said he was rendering thanks for having been brought up in a nation enlightened by the gospel? Now let's go back. John Wesley himself. Where was John Wesley born? Here, we'll see, we'll test your knowledge this morning. Just have to give me the country. Yes. John Wesley was born in England in 1703. He would live to be almost approximately 88. He died in 1791. So he lived for almost all of the uh, 18th century. You know, a lot of times today we say people in the 18th century didn't live that long. And many people were, they did die in childbirth or got tuberculosis or were killed by Indians. But there were many people who did live a long time. If I remember right, uh, John Adams, the second president, his mother lived, I think, from about 1699 to 1797. <laughs> Almost 100 years. But John Wesley, born in 1703, and we'll talk a little bit about him as a boy. His father was a preacher. His father was a minister. And they were very poor. They grew up very poor. They had a very large family, like a dozen children or more siblings all over the place, <laughs> so to speak. But in the one town where Mr. Wesley, the father, was preaching, his, um, his, his neighborhood there, they were not too friendly. You know, you all got here today in your cars and stuff and came. And how many here suffered persecution on the way to church this morning? How many here suffered persecution on the way to church this morning? No one. How many here suffered persecution during their week? No one. But of course, 
if we pay attention to the news in the United States, we know that there are a lot of Christians who are being persecuted. They might not be shot at at the moment or something, but they're fined $135,000 because they will not kind of make a cake for sodomy or something else that goes against God's word. There are Christians who are being persecuted very much. And uh, I would not say for granted that in my own life I have been dismissed from the job over this issue where, you know, the, the employer wanted me to print pornography and print whatever, and I said, as a Christian, I cannot do that. So, yes, we are living in an America that is increasingly more and more hostile. But actually, the England that young John Wesley grew up in was pretty hostile, too. I've never heard of anyone back then being put in jail because they wouldn't give a license for gay marriage or something of that nature, but there were a lot of people who were apt to go after preachers. And John Wesley's father was no exception from that. In fact, the men of the town, they burnt their house to the ground. Can you imagine that Pastor Andy as a pastor of a church and the people of the town you know, they keep warning you. They say, well, Mr. Wesley, take your gospel and go somewhere else. And he refuses. Instead, he, off, he opens up his hand and says, let me pray for you. And they say, off with your prayers. I don't want you. And then next night, they burn their house to the ground because they hated him. They didn't really hate him. It was God that they hated. That's where the hate was. But they leashed it out on John Wesley's father. And as that house was burning, burning to the ground, all the Wesleys, Mr. Wesley and his wife, and all the little Wesley children are running out of the house. And finally they notice that there's one child that is still in the house, up on one of the upper stories. A little boy named John. Uh, he was probably, I forget his age at this point, maybe five, seven, eight years old, just a little boy. And just in the nick of time, they were able to save him from that fire. And the men climbed up on their shoulders and got to the top window and were able to pull little baby John Wesley out. And Mr. Wesley, John Wesley's mother, from that point, would always believe that the Lord, because he did a miracle to save John Wesley's life, she always believed that the Lord would use John in a special way. And no doubt if Satan did indeed know what was to come of that life of John Wesley, there's no doubt that that would have been one of his attempts to get rid of him, even if Satan tried to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I'm sure Satan rejoiced that our Savior was on the cross and thought, oh, Satan. But Satan never fully comprehends the power of Almighty God. And as every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, indeed, as Pastor Andy stated there beautifully, the Lord indeed brought John Wesley, a little boy, out of a burning house. Then Mr. Wesley, he would go on, he'd go on to Oxford University in England, and uh, he would graduate, and he would be ordained in the Anglican Church. So he was ordained in the Anglican Church, we think of the Episcopalian Church today, and a um, young man preaching in the church, but was not converted, was not converted for some time. Now while at Oxford University, John Wesley and his brother Charles, who also then joined him at Oxford, and then with another young man, George Whitfield, and some other men, they began seeking the Lord. Now they had found at Oxford University that many of the youth there were into drinking and dancing and everything. So, but there was a minority of these young men, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, and some of the others, who started getting together regularly and studying the Word of God, praying regularly, seeking the Lord, if somehow they might be able to find peace and salvation in him. And it's kind of interesting, this went on for a few years. John Wesley himself was a preacher for probably 10 years before he himself was generally converted. He uh, at one point made a trip to Georgia, the colony of Georgia. At this point we would have England as another country and, and the 13 colonies in the 1730s period. And he went there seeking to somehow do great things for the Lord, and he got nothing accomplished. He come back to England completely disheartened. But at some point in this period, when his father was on his deathbed, the older Reverend John Wesley, he tried to instill in young John, as John was there by his bedside, that he should 
Give his heart to the Lord and have that peace inside. It says there in 1 John 5, 10, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And that's what John Wesley did not have. He was living by the Bible. He was living a biblical life. But a question for you, does living a biblical life get you into heaven? <coughs> no. We were talking about the couple over here that were married for 62 years. As a boy, I knew a couple, too, who were married for around 60 years. And we're honest, though the day is long. But to my knowledge, neither one was ever converted. And they're both dead, you know. And even though they live a lot more beautiful than many people who claim to be Christians, even, most likely they're in hell today. Unless something happened on their deathbed. It's very sad to think that someone could live a biblical life, but that's not where it's that's not where our salvation lies. And so finally, as a young preacher in his 30s, John Wesley, through seeking the Lord and through help of other ministers who were converted, he sought the Lord and the Lord gave him that peace. You know, I always say that if somebody is converted, there will be no doubt about it. You can see it in them. I still remember when I was coming to the Lord as a young man, and there was a widow lady, she was around 88, and she and I would pray on the phone regularly, and, and for around a month, I was trying to serve the Lord, and I actually thought I was doing pretty good. I was trying to clean up my ways, not think of anything mean, read the Bible regularly, but I was not converted. And one day, Sister Grace, that was her name, she said to me, I felt led of the Holy Ghost to ask you on the phone tonight if you ever actually repented of your sins and made Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior. And I said to her, I said, well, as a boy, I did that, but it does not mean anything. And so I remember at that point, we prayed over the phone, and I remember I prayed very solemnly, but there was no boat of lightning or anything. However, several hours later, I was in my bed in my room, and the lights were off, I think I set up, and it was a, it might have been two or three in the morning, that I felt a great joy in my life and my heart, and I felt myself praising the Lord Jesus over and over and over and over and over and over. And so that verse, that verse became real to me, he that believe on the Son of God hath to witness in himself. And so about the age of 35, approximately, John Wesley got that witness, that beautiful witness. Now, John Wesley, he would preach in England, as I think I might have mentioned earlier, for around 60 years, preaching the gospel. And, and what I would like to talk about are a lot of the results of those preaching and the revival, and how it affected England, and how it affected the country in which we live. How many here have ever lived in England? But how many here live in the United States? Show of hands. <laughs> So we need to talk about how these revivals affected where we live. Wouldn't that be nice to know what happened here in America? Now John Wesley, you know, the revivals that would start in England in the 1730s period, and they would run through much of the 18th century in England, you know, 30, 40 years straight. Imagine growing up, either on this side of the Atlantic or over there in England, say you're born in 1730. And the area that you're in is covered in revivals till 1770. Imagine that. You know, we'll read books in those times, and, and uh, I have a book here on George Washington that makes a comment that in those days it was apparent when everyone went to church. But as Pastor Andy said regarding the anointing, it is not just a ritual, it is because it's in our heart. The Bible says that we, we keep his commandments because we love him. Keep his commandments because we love him, not because we feel like he's a, a great taskmaster that's going to take a, an iron to us if we do not follow and obey him. But if we look at the picture here in America now, we'll back up a little bit. What was the first American colony established? Trivia. Virginia. I am for you. <laughs> Maybe next time I will be mean and make you answer. Virginia was 1607. Take a guess. What was the last colony established? Just take a guess. Yes, Georgia, about 1733. And the 13 colonies, as far as religion goes, what were they established as? Were they, I'll give you three choices. Were they established as Muslim colonies? Were they established as Buddhist colonies? Or were they established as Christian civilizations? Yes, yes indeed. I mean, many of them, 
such as the Mayflower Pilgrims. You know, they were persecuted in England in the days when you could not worship outside of the Anglican Church. In fact, you would be arrested or put in jail in England in the early 17th century under King James. And so many of these people ended up fleeing to what would become the 13 colonies to establish Christian civilization that these early, especially the early colonists, many of them were very zealous in the Lord. Uh, as an example, here's another trivia question. How long, like the Mayflower Pilgrims and Plymouth Colony, how long do you think their church service lasted every Sunday, every Lord's Day? Just take a guess. Eight hours. They were so in love with the Word of God, with this treasure of a book, that they spent four hours every morning with four different men preaching for an hour, and four hours every Sunday evening with four different men preaching for an hour, as well as singing. That should give you an idea. They didn't have their little telephones out and playing all the time. I know of someone recently who was murdered by accident because of a young kid who was doing something of that nature. Wasn't paying attention, right? And this was, he killed someone. Someone that I have witnessed to, and, and I don't know if that person was converted or not. Very ashamed. But they were so much into the Word of God. The Puritans, obviously, another group in the 17th century. So we see as the 17th century continued, the late 1600s, very regrettably, the spiritual zeal of the American colonists, uh, most of them began to go down. And some of it was because of things they had made mistakes with. A good example would be Puritans up in Massachusetts and Connecticut and those colonies. Their forefathers were so anxious for their colonies to be as Christian as possible that they made some mistakes. They, uh, they found out the hard way that you cannot uh, legislate Christianity or legislate morality. You know, you could not participate in the politics if you were not a member of the church in Puritan New England. You could not, um, be, now rightfully so, you could not become a member of the church unless you were converted. But as the late 1600s continued, uh, fewer and fewer Puritans were being converted. So fewer and fewer people were joining the church, and fewer and fewer people were participating in the politics of the colony. So finally, they had the audacity to adopt what they, they called it, the halfway covenant, whereby you can be not, become a member of the church and therefore participate in politics, but you cannot take part in communion in the church until you were converted. Now, does that make sense? But Pastor Andy, you have a member in this church, accept someone in membership and say, well, you can become a member, but you can't take part in communion until you convert it. Does that make sense? And so it was because of compromise. I was at a school for, I was actually a civil government some years ago, and the people running it, they said, the one word we hate is compromise. And I tell you, if anyone hates the word compromise, it's not. You can never, ever, ever ever, ever compromise the word of God. So because of these various compromises in the colonial churches here in America, by say 1710, 1720, even though the mother country, England, was considered Christian civilization, and even though her 13 colonies here in America were considered Christian civilization, the amount of people who were actually born again were in the minority, by large. In fact, it was well known that many ministers were not converted. You could have a church down the road and the people of the church know their minister is not converted, but they still go every Sunday. I think one historian there, I think in Connecticut, he said in those days, the forms were kept up. You know, people going to church regularly and someone standing in the pulpit and speaking, but there was no power in it. Pastor Annie this morning sought the power of the Lord in the anointing service of this morning. But the people, they didn't seek the power of the Lord. There was actually an earthquake in colonial America, New England, about 1727. And one minister who was converted, he lamented, he said, here we have had an earthquake. And yet the people still are hard. They have not come to the Lord Jesus Christ. But in those years, late 1720s especially, the Holy Spirit, the Lord in his mercy, you know, we said it at the beginning, 
Man is reprobate. Man is nothing on his own. Man is worthless. He can do nothing on his own. It is only through the blood of Jesus Christ, only through the Holy Spirit changing his life, that he becomes something beautiful, that he becomes a treasure. But only because of the Lord Jesus Christ, not because of anything we ever do. And the Lord, in his mercy, and he did not have to. You know, the Lord does not have to save this person or that person. But the Lord, in his love and in his mercy, in the late 1720s, began stirring ministers in different parts of the 13 American colonies. Uh, one minister actually preached a sermon entitled on the dangers of an unconverted ministry. You know, regarding these ministers who were in the pulpit and were not converted. So finally, by the early 1730s, we began seeing great revival break out here in colonial America. And uh, some of the most famous American preachers or preachers that would be involved from America and England would be Jonathan Edwards, and of course, George Whitfield, of whom we spoke a little bit ago. John Wesley himself never returned to America again after he had been there in Georgia before he was converted. However, thousands of John Wesley's followers, as we well know, Methodist, Circuit Ryan preachers, Francis Asbury, tons of them, would cross this, the 13 colonies and the early United States from coast to coast, really. Uh, George Whitfield, I think I read, when he would come to America and rode from one end of the colonies to the other end, that it was the farthest that any non-Indian had rode across America in his love and his deep desire. And that was one thing with John Wesley and George Whitfield, though, when they're preaching, they didn't just go to the churches. Many times the churches were closed to them, whether it was an Anglican minister or some other formal type minister would say, well, we can't have them in here. They preach too evangelically. They have people coming up to the altar. We do not formalistic church. And so Whitfield and Wesley, those men, they would preach literally in the fields. They would go to slaves. They were some of the first preachers to preach to the slaves. Uh, when a slave was converted, they saw them as a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ just as anyone else. They would go to poor miners. Uh, there's a story where Whitfield and Wesley were preaching to miners there, I believe, in New York. Or not New York, I said that wrong, in England, still in the old mother country, England. And the men, their faces were covered black with soot. But as they heard the salvation and the loving gospel message, tears stained down their acidic faces. And many of those people you know, they ended up building these churches. The yeah, and churches have nothing to do with folks like that. So John Wesley, George Whitfield, they would help these poor communities of miners and whoever, the old churches. In one case, they took an old gunnery factory turned it into a church. You know, that's what they had. You know, this is a beautiful building. I would never put it down, but it doesn't have to be like this. It can be a shack down the road. You know, the late Mayor Pilgrims, when they were first meeting, they met in a house. There's nothing wrong. The Bible actually talks about it, meeting from house to house in the New Testament. But Whitfield and Wesley, so Wesley would be in England, and Whitfield, he would really become the predominant preacher, the most famous preacher here in colonial America, George Whitfield. Now, there were hundreds of ministers who were used by the Lord, obviously. But there are only some that became so famous. George Whitfield obviously became so famous, he would preach to as many as 20 or 30,000 at a time, without the benefit of a microphone. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, who became a good friend of Whitfield, said that he had calculated that Whitfield's booming voice without a microphone could be heard by 30,000 people. Obviously, that was a gift of the Lord. I want to read a little quote here, and it's actually a quote from Mr. Franklin here. And it talks about how these revivals, you know, we think of a revival today, a lot of times it's just everybody goes to church for five, six days of the week or have a little camp meeting, and then they go back and everything, nothing ever changed. But listen to this. Tell me if this seems any different when I read this. And this is speaking of Whitfield and Benjamin Franklin. It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were going religious, so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing songs sung in different families of every street. Does that sound like a revival today? People don't know what the word revival means apparently anymore. That was a real revival. 
But there were a lot of other aspects. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I brought some artifacts. And you know, as we talk about these things in the 18th and 19th century, just keep in mind that this can be today. This is not relegated, regulated to 1750. The Lord God says, I'm the Lord God, I change not. And so we believe in Him. We can see communities change today. You know, I, and it, it happened in John Wesley's day. At the beginning of the 18th century, England was kind of messed up, their culture. Anything could have happened to England. By the end of the 18th century, England was a beautiful country in which to live. And so would be the 13 colonies. Uh, England, you know, in the 19th century, Queen Victoria herself. One time there was a native from, I think, maybe India or Africa was there. And asked the, he said, I want to see the greatness of England. What, I want to see the most special thing you have in England. And Queen Victoria, she could have showed him the crown jewels. What do you think she did instead? She handed him a Bible. And she said, this is what made England great. She didn't hand him her crown. She didn't show him around the palace and say, all this gold we've accumulated. She handed him a Bible. So some of the results. So let's look at education as an example of something that was affected by the revivals. Now in America, the revivals became known as the First Great Awakening, which went from about 1730 to 1760, 1770. And then there was the Second Great Awakening, which went from about, well, started around 1790. And there would be revivals in America almost nonstop until the 1870s. So that somebody who lived 80 years in those days could have lived their entire life in the United States that was inundated with revival in those days. The Methodist Church, as an example, was building one or two new churches every single day in the United States. How many do they build a day now? <laughs> I don't know if you have a statistic. How many do they build a year? Maybe I should ask that. <laughs> you have a statistic? I know it's not one or two every day. And uh, if John Wesley was here today, and we'll get into some of that, but I know that he would say, shame, shame, shame. Not just on the Methodists, but on the Baptists and Independents and whatever. Because we see what the United States is becoming. But let's briefly go through some ways that the revivals affected the country and try to relate it to today. We'll start with education. Uh, the New England Primer, this is a school book printed in 1777, and this is in the school book, a school book that would have been used in both public and private schools. And in those days, no one was ashamed even in the public schools of the Word of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So listen to this in the public schools and private schools of colonial America. How glorious is our heavenly King, who reigns above the sky! How shall a child presume to to sing his dreadful majesty. How great his power is none can tell, nor think how large his grace, nor men below, nor saints that dwell on high before his face. <coughs> and when the book goes through the letters of the alphabet, it uses things from, Bible, from the Bible. Letter A talks about an Adam's fall, we sin all, and it goes through the letters of the alphabet teaching salvation. Another school book. Now, a gentleman named Noah Webster, and there were two famous Websters in early American history. One was Noah and one was Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster was a statesman, a Christian statesman. But Noah Webster had been converted himself, oh, I think about 1807, during the Second Great Awakening. Now, what did Noah Webster, what was he famous for? Is that the only thing that he was famous for? No way. I think it is a terrible, terrible shame how people do not know what Noah Webster did. Here was something just as ever important, maybe even more important than the dictionary. The blueback speller. Noah Webster wrote school books using the public and private schools of America. I think by 1850, something like 60 million of these have been sold. 60 million. They said of Noah Webster that he taught millions to read, but not one to sin. Lesson one, no man may put off the law of God. My joy is in his law all the day. Oh, may I not go in the way of sin. Let me not go in the way of ill men. School book, 
You know, it's interesting, in the 1840s, 1850s, there was a federal Supreme Court ruling that said that the Bible should be taught in the public education system. And as far as the dictionary goes, how many here have ever seen his first main dictionary, 1828? Raise your hand if you've ever seen a copy or original of Webster's first dictionary. Let's just read a couple definitions. Uh, the word seek, S-E-E-K, to seek something. To seek God, his name, or his face in scripture. To ask for his favor, direction, and assistance. God seeks men when he fixes his love on them and by his word and spirit and the righteousness of Christ. Reclaims and recovers them from their miserable condition as sinners. And then he gives references in Ezekiel and Psalms and Luke. Out of the word seek, I count something like 17 Bible verses out of that one word. Not every word in the dictionary has a Bible verse with it, but many do. I went through the letter W. You would think W is kind of an obscure letter. In 10 pages, I counted 50 Bible verses. I think it was about 20 years ago that Newsweek, there was an article where they said, more and more we are finding that it was the Bible more than the Constitution that formed the United States of America. And aren't we seeing it in some of these things? Uh, speaking of the Constitution, I guess we can talk about the civil government then. About 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence. Half of them went to what kind of school? And this is, you're right. And this is uh, another result of the Bible. Many colleges were founded in America directly through the preaching of George Whitfield, of course, one of the people who was a great comrade of John Wesley. Uh, historically, there was at one point a pretty good dispute between the two over doctrine, Calvinism and Arminianism, but they did both love each other in the Lord, and John Wesley preached Whitfield's funeral in England. So, another question here for you. Historians several years ago went through tens of thousands of original literature of the 200 men who founded the United States. Remember, I said 200, not just Thomas Jefferson, but 200 men. Most of them not remember today. What did they quote more than anything else? Yes. What percentage of their quotes do you think were the Bible? 34%. A third. You'll see uh, sentences, for example, George Washington writes a sentence, and the sentence, he might have as many as five or seven Bible references in the same sentence. They were taught to think in terms of the Bible. I remember the homeschool, one of the things I was taught, and it's the way it should be, is that the Bible always, and every single facet of life, would be based entirely on the Word of God, on the Scripture. And I would agree very much with Queen Victoria. This is what makes a people. This is what makes the community beautiful. This is what makes the local community beautiful. This is what makes the state beautiful. What makes the entire nation beautiful. Uh, regarding back to the Founding Fathers, this is a set of law books that were written about 1765. They were written by William Blackstone. How many here know who William Blackstone was or at least heard of him? Raise your hand. My family doesn't know either. If we were living in 1775, even the common people would know who William Blackstone was. Uh, he was in England. He wrote his four-volume series on the commentaries of law. They became the premier law book for American lawyers and American law schools from the days of the War for Independence all the way up to around 1930. So for 160 years, these were the premier law books. I'll get that later. <laughs> we have in the testament of Charles Finney. How many here remember Charles Finney? How many knows how Charles Finney got converted? Anyone? That's the law. You're correct. About 1812. He was, signed, he was studying to be a lawyer. And he said the old law authors referred to the Bible so much that he got a Bible. And the rest is history. I think he led around half a million Americans to salvation in Jesus Christ. Often when he would preach, he would preach as if it wasn't a courtroom. Where the Lord Jesus, his blood would be atoned and we are therefore pardoned for our sins. So William Blackstone's law book his very words are even in the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson wrote. Now, in my study of the founding fathers of the 200 men considered founders of our country, 
The overwhelming majority of them were Christians. There's no doubt that they were Christians. There are only two famous who I would say did not seem to have been converted, but still had a very deep respect for God's word, were Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, say as governor of Virginia, issued a proclamation for a day of fasting and prayer. And when he was president, he ended his letters within the year of our Lord Christ. So there was a fear of God in him, though regrettably in, in neglect of salvation. Now, on his deathbed, or maybe at some point something may have changed, so we can't just say, well, he's in hell. But uh, from his writings, we would conclude that he never somehow believed in genuine salvation. But Thomas Jefferson, writing the Declaration of Independence, he put a phrase in there that's actually right from William Blackstone's law book the laws of nature and of nature's God. And what William Blackstone had said was that all man made laws are to be based on two foundations. Number one foundation, natural law. Blackstone defined natural law as the natural things that God created when he created the earth, how uh, the earth revolved. And he said, for example, from the natural law, we can tell it's wrong to murder, even without the word of God. We know it's wrong to murder just from seeing it because of the pain and the blood, etc. And really what he said is what it says in the beginning of Romans, that if we had not the word of God, we would still be without excuse because we can see the Lord God in his creation. And then the second foundation that Blackstone said all American and English law should be based on is the Word of God. He actually says in there, and it sounds like a sermon, he says, because Adam and Eve sinned, because of their transgression, man's reason is messed up. Because we have this sinful nature, our reason is messed up. And he says, he writes in the law book, this is in the law book, that God through his mercy and the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the scriptures. And he said, on these two foundations, the law of nature and the Bible, all man-made laws are to be made. And he said, if any man-made law ever runs contrary to the word of God, it is of no validity, and is to be ignored. Would, had that kind of law book been in Nazi Germany in 1930? It sounds like the book of Acts, we also gave God rather than man. But when the Hebrew midwives were commanded to kill the male Israelite like children, they're fair, and they said, we will not, we fear God, we will not murder. So continuing on, there were many other things affected. One thing, obviously, family life. We heard of one couple married for 62 years. You know, I believe that in colonial America before the revival, divorce basically was not allowed. But I would suspect there were a lot of marriages where people were living as if they were divorced. You had two sinners living together, both grumpy, bitter, but the revival has changed that very greatly. Family life, we read in the quote from Ben Franklin, the family sang the song together. Another thing affected. Um, other things that were affected were decency in life. Um, I think it was in the 1800s, for example, at one point the Comstock Law was prohibited obviously, or anything like that going to um, going through the post office, through the mail. Uh, we saw a great decline in bar rooms, and uh, we know we had the scripture earlier regarding uh, immorality, a great decline in that. I have actually a record from a settler historian where he talked about how Martha Washington as a young lady wore dresses that were not that modest. They were immodest, very flashy, but she gave her heart to the Lord. Read the Bible for 50 years every morning. An hour in prayer and Bible reading every morning for 50 years till she died. And the same secular non-Christian, probably anti-Christian historian wrote that because of the revival, by the time George Washington was inaugurated president, she wore a simple, modest dress to the inauguration. So all these different things affected. And uh, and I would give an example too. How much longer do I have back there? I mean, I don't want to we should be coming to a close there. But how some of these things affect us today? You know, um, I of course saw, watched on the internet recently how the Methodist Church Conference had this vote about sodomy. And I, you know, I say to myself, if John Wesley was living today, what in the world do you think he would say? Just as the Lord Jesus took a whip of cord against the money changers in the temple, what do you think John Wesley would do to the Methodist Church? You just read one of the verses about things like that today, the young man. They're, they're. 
I mean, it's plain. You may, you know, there's not a Bible verse that says what color the carpet should be. But these things of immorality and morality are laid out as clear as can be. And I think uh, another thing that is greatly, very greatly missing in the churches today, but it was something preached by John Wesley, preached by George Whitworth, that the Word of God comes first. And that regardless of what our family may command us to do, regardless of what the civil go government may command us to do, regardless of what a sinful church conference, you know, a sinful church conference that embraces abortion or sodomy, regardless of what something like that happens, we obey God's law first. It is very clear, you know, from the writings of, say, someone like George Washington, who was a devout Christian, if he was governor, and I know he's from Virginia, but we're in Pennsylvania, if he was governor of Pennsylvania today, there is no doubt that on day one of his governorship, he would immediately, based on the word of God alone, as well as the state constitution, ignore Roe versus Wade and close every abortion clinic in the country. I have a picture here. This is a second trimester legal abortion. You tell me that that's not murder. But George Washington, if he would be governor today, on day one, would ignore a Bargabell versus Hodges and have every person given a license for sodomy arrested. I mean, these people, they took the word of God seriously. And it's not because it's of hate. I know of someone that was involved in Alabama, some different judges down there who took stands and to this day have never. No animosity toward the homosexuals. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and he died for their sins as well. So we cannot embrace sin. I mean, if we're going to legalize gay marriage, we're going to legalize drunkenness, you might as well legalize bank robbery. It's all sin. You can't pick what you want and do not want. But I often think, and Queen Kendra, you can come up, I'll have her do a closing down.